I will be reading Titus chapter 1, verse 6 through seven, or 9. And then afterwards I will be reading 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 through 7. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violence or greedy in gain but hospital, a lover of God, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound and doctrine, and also rebuke those who contradict it. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but not a lover of money. He must change his own, he must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone who does not know how to manage his own household How will he know how to care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be thought of by outsiders, that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Amen. Morning, church family. How are you all this morning? Y'all, you guys uh, got your appetites this morning? We've got our fellowship potluck afterwards, so this is my personal invitation to each and every one of you that's sitting here. Stay for fellowship. Fellowship is one of the beautiful things about being part of God's body. Amen? All right, that's how we get to know one another. That's how we build community and unity within the body. Um, this morning, um, I'm not going to be able to tell you anything that you can't read in scriptures, and I don't know who said this, but they uh, but they were asking a, a wise teacher once, "What's the most important thing that you've learned in the scriptures?" And this is what he retorted: "That Jesus loves me." It's simple, right? That's that's simple. That's what it's about: is Jesus loves me. Uh, so this morning, before we begin, what I want to invite you to do is to please stand up with me and to sing Jesus Loves Me because it's a simple truth, but yet a powerful truth that we need to remember. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. What wonderful news that is. Jesus loves me. Could almost just dismiss church right there, right? (laughs) Jesus loves me. This I know. Several years ago when I was down in uh, Lubbock, Texas, uh, Lubbock Christian University was having their 50th anniversary. And so they invited Colin Powell to come and to speak for this wonderful event that they were having celebrating it. If you don't know who Colin Powell is, Colin Powell is one of the uh, America's modern day uh, military heroes, if you will. Uh, he went through ROTC during uh, college, and by the way, he was a C student. So those of you who are C students, there's hope for you, okay? Um, 
But don't try to make C's. But he was a C student. He was in ROTC. He uh, got a commission as a second lieutenant, worked his way up through the ranks and became a four-star general. Uh, he worked with the President Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, and Bush Jr. Uh, he also served as security advisor for the United States. He was the first African American to serve as chairman uh, for the Joint Chief of Staffs of the United States. And he also served as Secretary of State uh, in the President's Cabinet. So he had a very successful military career, and many people thought that he was going uh, to go on and become the first African-American president, but his wife said no. <laughs> so that put an end to that conversation. Um, so he was a great military leader, uh, and nobody can deny his, his strategic uh, planning ability as a military leader. And in this speech that he was given at Lubbock Christian University when he was talking about leadership and he was talking about the importance of the principles that a leadership needs to embody, one of the things that really stuck with me, really it's the main thing that I remember him saying, he said, now suppose I've got two lieutenants and I tell the first lieutenant, go take that hill. And that lieutenant says, okay, well, um, what's air support going to be like? Uh, what's my reinforcements? Uh, what kind of artillery can we expect? And then I tell him, and then he takes off to achieve that objective. And then I tell the other lieutenant, it's the same kind of hill. I say, go and take that hill. And that lieutenant, he just jumps right to it, goes after it, Johnny on the spot. And he says, which one of them do you suppose is a better lieutenant? Yeah, that's what most people think is the first one or the second one. But he said, neither. He says, the leadership that depends upon what they're doing and their objectives has nothing to do with their style of carrying out what they are trying to do. But he says, as their leader for me, my job is to make sure that they have in their hands the tools and whatever the information is to be able to achieve their objective. True leadership is making sure that your subordinates have what they need to fulfill their task. And in the church, it's no different. In the church, though, those who are going to lead us as shepherds, as elders in the church body, must be representatives of Jesus Christ. Amen? They must have the quality and the character of Jesus embodied in their life. And they must be able to teach us through information, through experience, or placing the tools in our hand through training so that we may be able to live a godly and Christian life. Amen? That's what shepherds do. That's what they're about. And as the leaders of the congregation have come to us and said they're looking for men who have the ability, who have the qualities, who have the qualifications to be shepherds among us, bring forth these names. I think it's important for us to look at what Paul tells his two young evangelists about the kind of quality of their character that we need to hone in on and that we need to look at. Leadership is important. Amen? Any business or any organization that is going to be successful must have successful, have successful leaders. Amen? So we need to be aware and think seriously and soberly about the kinds of leaders that we are putting forth. Because the kind of leaders that are being put forth are the kind of leaders that they're also going to develop. And the kind of leaders that they are is going to set the direction for the congregation. Amen? If you'll notice that the two scriptures that were read this morning, that they're not identical in Timothy and Titus. They're pretty close to being identical, but they're not identical. You know what that tells us? It's not a checklist. It's not a checklist that we go through and we're like, yep, they got this, they got this, check, they got this, check. But rather, what Paul is telling Timothy and what he's telling Titus, he's like, Look at the quality of their character because the quality of their character is what qualifies them to be able to be shepherds. And so he gives us a list. And the first list 
that he gives us or the first area of life that he wants us to look into is their domestic life. He says they must be above reproach and blameless in their domestic life. That is, they have to be a good husband and they have to be a good father. But more than just being a good husband and being a good father, they have to be blameless and above reproach. What that means is they are not open to attacks. You can't point to the way that they've been a husband and attack them. You can't point to the way that they've been a father and criticize them because they are blameless in the way that they have been as a husband and as a father in their life. He says that they are to be the husband of but one wife. The word in the Greek means that they are a one woman man, right? A one woman man. They're, they don't have multiple women or multiple wives. In the ancient world, they practiced polygamy, right? So they would have multiple wives, they would have multiple women. And Paul says, you can't have multiple women, multiple women and multiple wives. And a large part of that is the theology that we look at it back into the beginning. It was Adam and Eve, right? One man, one woman who were to procreate and to fill the rest of the earth. And he says that they must have believing children. And notice what he says here in verse 6 about this in Titus. In verse 6 he says, if in, uh, in the latter part of it, his children are to be believers not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. This is extremely important. The indication from the Scriptures, right? We have to ask, Paul, why are you telling us this? Why does this matter? What are we looking at? If he's, what are we looking at and, and what is it supposed to tell us in his domestic life? He's able to pass on his faith and to shepherd his own children in his own household. The indication is that the children are grown, that he has been able to pass on his faith to his children so that they're not open to the charge of living a loose life and living in debauchery and not that they're atheist or agnostic. There are two people, well, I'm sorry, there's a group of people that are the closest to us in our lives. You know who that is? It's our family. It's the ones we share a roof with. Amen. You know what we can't hide from our families? We can't hide who we truly are if we're living in the same household, right? Right? Because it's too tiresome to wear a mask all the time. The mask has to come off. If he mistreats his wife or he mistreats his children, what do you think he's going to do to us? If, he's, if he has been unable to shepherd his wife, if he's been, able to, been unable to shepherd his children, how is he going to be able to shepherd the household of God? Timothy says if he cannot manage the household of God, how will he, I'm sorry, if he cannot manage his own household, how shall he manage the household of God? It is the instruction, it is the discipline, it is the faithfulness, it is the commitment that he's made to his wife to his children, to raising them that highlight a quality that is about what he is about. means that he's about what God is about. He's focused on God changing him and changing his life. And it says that he must be blameless. If we were to look at any other scripture in the New Testament or Old Testament, which tells us that he must be blameless, or that this must be something that you focus on, then it's not something that is negotiable, is it? It's something that must happen. It's the first area of defense. The Christian home is the place where Christian leadership is developed. Amen? Amen. The second area, and I want you to notice this in Titus, in verse 7. He says, For an overseer of God, as I'm sorry, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He moves on to a second area and reiterates himself about these qualities that he is about to come forth with. It says that he must be blameless in these areas. He must not be open to a charge of these kinds of behavior, to these vices 
and this misbehavior that you might find in his life. It says that he must not be overbearing, that he must not be arrogant. Why are you telling us this, Paul? Why must a shepherd not be overbearing or be arrogant? Because he's going to have to deal with people who are not heads, right? Like me, right? Like you. He's going to have to deal with, with people who have issues, who have problems, who, who struggle sometimes maybe to understand the Scriptures, who struggle to, to maybe bring their life in line with Christ but have a desire to. He needs to be able to do that and he has to have the patience to be able to do that. And if he's overbearing over top of you and just pushing upon you and bearing down upon you, what's the likelihood that you're going to respond to that? Huh? What's the likelihood that you're going to respond to that? What happens when you meet someone who is overbearing and arrogant? Are you going to go to them with your problems? No, you're not, are you? You're going to keep your problems away from them. He says that they must not be quick-tempered or easily angered. Right? Someone who's flying off of the handle at the smallest little thing. Well, guess what? Life is messy, isn't it? Things happen. Things don't always go as planned. Things don't always go the way that you would expect them to. You need someone who is mature enough to handle a situation that comes up calmly. Right? Someone who's going to keep their head and keep their cool. Not someone who's just going to fly off the handle. What if you do something wrong? Do you want them flying off at the handle at you? No. It's not going to help. It's not going to help correct you. It's not going to help shape and mold your heart to be more like Jesus. It says that they're not given to drunkenness, right? The, the Greek literally means that they do not sit long beside their wine. And they're not someone who's just sitting with it and just, and just going. Someone who is drunk doesn't have the temperament. They don't have the patience. They don't have the desire. They don't have the self-control. They're, they are not allowing the Spirit of God to transform them. They've become addicted to this substance. That's what is controlling them rather than the Holy Spirit. Paul in Galatians uh, uh, in Ephesians says, Do not be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want this man to be a drunkard because if he's a drunkard, he's not going to be able to shepherd you. He's not available. The thing that he is after and constantly setting beside is what? It's the alcohol. It also says that he should not be a violent man, that he should not be a striker. If you see a man and his character and his nature and something goes wrong, if he's always someone that calls you to step to the line and bows out his chest and say, we can handle this outside like men, then you know he's not a man of God. Amen? Because a man of God doesn't bow out his chest and put his finger in your chest and say, we can handle this outside like men. Literally, he's not a striker. He's not a violent man. Because we don't want a shepherd or a leader among us who is violent, do we? Right? We don't want him hitting somebody because he's anger and quick-tempered and flies off the handle. But it also says that he must not be a lover of money. We take up a collection each and every week. And it's a pretty good sum of money. We need to be able to trust them to have oversight over the money and not direct the money, right, here to this channel and that channel to, for their own personal agendas or for their own coffers or their own pockets, but to be able to use the money properly and correctly for the work of the church. Amen? They have to be trustworthy in this manner. Paul, why are you telling us these things? Because these men are going to shepherd you to become like Jesus. But then he says there's some virtues that you need to be looking out for. They must have these virtues in full display in their life. They must be hospitable. Literally, it means that they are lovers of strangers. You might think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. They have a hospitality about their spirit. They're open to people who are different. They're open to people who they don't know. They're friendly, right? There's a hospitality about them. Because if the elders are going to lead us and guide us to be ministers of the gospel and they themselves are not friendly with people and not open to people who are strangers to them or people who look different than them, 
How are we ever going to have the confidence and the ability to be able to do that? Amen? They must be hospitable. They must love what is good. It's loving the things that are pure in life, the things that are good in life, and and refusing to participate in them, refusing to allow that wickedness and the evilness of the world to influence them, right? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. They understand this. They love what is good and they hold to it. They're self-controlled. They're able to control their desires. You might be thinking about sitting beside wine too long. They're able to control themselves, have a drink without being a drunkard or without living for the drink. Someone who is able to be disciplined in their life so that they are in compliance with the Spirit of God and with the Spirit of Christ in their life. They must be upright in their living. That is, God has a standard. And and they're not men who are lowering God's standard, but they're men who agree with God's standard and hold God's standard high and say... This is what I'm living for, and the reason that I'm living for it is my Lord has commissioned me to live for it. My Lord has called me to live this way. They don't lower God's standard, which goes along with the next one, that they must be holy, that they've set their lives apart so that it's different, and they're blameless in this area. You can't point to an area of your, their life and say, this is an unholy practice that you have in your life. And they must be respectable. That is worthy of honor. If there's someone who is deplorable and someone who mistreats people, obviously they're not going to be respectable, are they? If they've mistreated people, if they've wronged people, if they've, if they've stolen money from people, all of these characteristics that Paul is talking about, these are things that we can identify that Paul says it tells you about the quality of their character. Because if they're not displaying this in their life, then they're not able to lead God's church. Amen? I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Jesus says that you shall know a tree by the fruit that it bears. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. Right? You can know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And when we look at men and consider those who would be shepherds, who would be qualified among us, We can look at the fruit that is in their life. What fruit are we looking for? Paul's given us a description here of the kinds of qualities that they should have in their domestic life and in their personal life. But we also might think about Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23. The fruits of the Spirit. What is on display of the fruit in their life is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness, and self-control. These are men that we can see this, that it's evident in their life. We don't have to go looking around and, 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 and try to find little bits and pieces of these things in their lives, but that it's truly evident. I'm reminded in Second Peter, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 24, Peter, I'm sorry, uh, Paul tells Timothy, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. He must not be quarrelsome. He's not someone who's always getting into fights and going round and round with people. But kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, with gentleness. The last thing that Paul says to Timothy, he says the same thing to, to Timothy, um, to Titus, and he says the same thing to Timothy as well. He says they must be able to teach. They must hold to the truth and trustworthiness of sound doctrine. They have to know the Bible. They have to have given themselves to the scriptures and studied it so that they're able to encourage others to encourage us. They have to be able to teach us and be able to to listen to where each and every one of us is at and the questions that we have and, and and the spiritual growth that we desire. They have to be able to teach us how to reach toward it 
how to live into it. Help us to understand it so that we may live it. And then if there's opponents of the truth of sound doctrine, they have to be qualified of knowing the Scriptures to be able to refute it. But in a gentle way, right? In a godly way. Not in a quarrelsome way, but in a holy and in a righteous manner and fashion. Amen? There is a quality of character that we need to be looking out for, that we need to be thinking about when we look at these. Wherever the shepherds are at, wherever leaders are at, where are the followers going to be? Here. It's a really high standard. I'm not denying that it's, it is a really high standard. But it's the greatest institution in the world, amen? The church is the greatest institution of the world because it's commissioned by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And He is calling men to stretch themselves out and to desire to be the kind of man that can lead you and me as a church body to become more like Him. This is an area that we can't compromise on. This is an area that we must insist, as Paul insists to his young apprentices, this is the kind of man that you need to be looking out for, Timothy, that you need to be looking out for. And these men aren't perfect, right? It's not saying that they're perfect, but they have to be above reproach, and they have to be blameless in these areas. I didn't write the word. I'm just telling you what it says. Leadership is so important. It can't be a good old boy slap you on the back and say, well, he's a good old boy and I like him. It's not my standard. It's not your standard. It's God's standard, right? And if they're going to lead us, then they have to be men who are already following the Lord. Amen? And they're men that we need to be praying for. We need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be praying for our elders. We need to be praying for wisdom and for guidance and for the Spirit to be instructing them. We need to be praying for them. And so this morning, what I want to encourage us to do is be praying. The elders have come to us and asked us to bring forth names of men who would be qualified to to be shepherds and to be deacons. We need to be praying for it. The church oftentimes would take days to fast and to pray for it in the New Testament before they appointed elders. If it is comfortable for you, if you're able to do it, I would encourage you to fast and to pray for elders of this congregation. Uh, Pray and fast for the men that you think would be qualified to be shepherds of this congregation. Uh, If you can't fast for a couple days, maybe fast for one meal, or maybe you'll fast for one day. And through that whole day, use those hunger pains as an invitation from God to invite you in to pray for those men, to pray for the leadership of this congregation, to pray for the revival of the minds and the hearts of this area. And our leaders are going to help us to get there. So let us end with a prayer this morning. Uh, And I invite you to please stand uh, if it's convenient for you and you're able to stand. And we'll pray for our leaders, and then we'll sing the song of invitation. Let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, as we come before you and come um, into your throne room right now as a body gathered together, we're grateful that you are here with us this morning and that your presence is here. We pray, Father, as we consider what the elders have asked us to consider men that would be qualified, that would have these quality in their characters that are displayed. We pray that you would give us wisdom and that you would give us insight to be able to see the fruit, to be able to to understand what it is that you have, through inspiration, given Paul to write to Timothy and to Titus, to look at these qualities in a man's domestic life and in his personal life uh, compared to the, the vices and the virtues that he has and displays. And we pray, Lord, that you would put upon these men's heart that you are calling them and that you have called them to be shepherds and to be leaders.
But on the other side, Father, if those are men who are questioning, I pray that you would give them an answer that you don't think that they are qualified, Lord. This is your church, and we desire, Lord, to have the leaders that you appoint. And so give us wisdom, give us understanding, give us insight, make it evident to us. Fill us, Father, with certainty and with confidence for these men that you are calling to be the shepherds and to be the leaders of your church. And we pray, Father, for our current leaders, that you would fill them with continued wisdom and with leadership and with understanding. And pray, Father, that they would help to lead us and to guide us to become more like you. We love you, Father, and we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.